message of grace is brought to you by Christian people who believe the Bible to be the Word of God and who appreciate its power and authority. Within the pages of the Bible itself, there is a God-given design for its study. Rightly dividing the Word of Truth is the key to understanding the Bible. We're glad you've joined us for another interesting look into God's infallible book as Richard Jordan, president of Grace School of the Bible, presents another in a series of messages designed to help you understand and enjoy the Bible. Let's join them now. We're certainly glad you joined us today. We're always glad to have you with us, and uh, we trust that our time together in God's Word will prove a real blessing and help to you. We're going to look at Romans chapter number 6 today. We're moving in, as we've been studying through the book of Romans, into what is really probably the most exciting part of the book, uh, at least from my perspective, Romans 6, 7, and 8, where you begin to see the, the identity that God has given you, the position that God has given us in the Lord Jesus Christ, and that the impact that that position has on our lives in time. Uh, Romans 6, 1, he says, What shall we say then? In other words, because of what he's taught us in the first five chapters about God's grace, about, the, about all that God has accomplished for us in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ when he died at Calvary. And you know, I draw, I draw the cross up here and, and I put it there because it, 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 it represents what, uh, in, in a figurative way, uh, the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died at Calvary. He died there for you and for me. And then he was buried and then he was raised again the third day. And in his death and in his resurrection, the first five chapters of the book of Romans have settled the issue of our sins. Our sins have been completely paid for and the, the, the condemnation and the death and all of the penalty of our sin and the result of our sin eternally have been taken care of. And we have in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ the complete and total answer. In his resurrection, the resurrection of Christ declares the death of Christ to be sufficient payment for sins. The wages of sin is death. Jesus Christ died for our sins. He completely put away sin by the sacrifice himself. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. What God is able to accomplish for us through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ is what grace is all about. Grace is the free gift to you. God just delightfully giving to you that which His grace, which, which His Son, rather, has accomplished for us at Calvary. Now that wonderful truth of all that, and the, the eternal security that that gives us, and the position and the dynamic of having the past taken care of, and, and, and all being free, and the life of Christ being given to us. Uh, the, the, the point is that that eternal life that is ours, all of this now impacts us. This is not something that you have when you die and go to heaven. This is something that is your possession right now in time on planet earth as a member of the body of Christ, as a child of God. This is who you are in Christ. You are in Christ. You've been taken out of Adam and placed into Christ. Once you were over here in Adam, once you were over here lost in Adam, uh, lost and condemned because of, of, of sin and because of, uh, of the consequences and the condemnation of sin. But when you came to Christ and trusted Him, you were placed over here into the Lord Jesus Christ, into what the Bible calls the, the body of Christ, a spiritual unit of believers who are identified in living oneness with His Son. And you're given the righteousness of God in Him. We're given His life. We're given His, uh, His righteousness, His status and we have this new position over here in God's grace and we have his life and we have his 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 uh, his, his uh, possessions and we're an heir of God and a joint heir with the Lord Jesus Christ now that issue having been moved from here to there from from Adam to Christ and being being given given new life in him what shall we say then what does that have to do with life in the nasty now and now day in and day out Somebody said to me one time, he says, well, you know, you guys are just preaching pie in the sky by and by. I live in the nasty now and now. Well, listen, let me tell you something. If your religion won't tell you where you're going to go when you die, it isn't worth a dead horse. You might as well get rid of it. You know that? There is a, nasty, there is a, there is a by and by, folks. And I want some pie in the sky by and by, if you want to put it that way. I'm looking forward to the sweet by and by, and I'm looking forward to spending eternity with the, with the God of heaven and earth and, and being able to bring glory and honor to Him because of what He has done through me. Just be a vessel. And because of the death of, of Christ at Calvary and His cross work there, we have the privilege of being able to present our bodies as vehicles for God to use and, and, uh, for His glory. And He's going to do that throughout all the ages of eternity future. And I'm looking forward to that. 
But I want you to understand that I don't have to die and go to heaven to get that. That's mine right now. In the nasty now and now, His life lives in me now. His freedom, His righteousness, His Son lives in me. And if you're saved, He lives in you. And the issue isn't religion, the issue is what God's doing. The issue isn't what you think about it, or I think about it, or Grandma thinks about it. The issue is what God thinks about it, and what God says. And you need to understand that. And what Paul's going to do in Romans chapter 6 is he's going to demonstrate that what God and His grace has given to us as a free gift has an impact in our life in time for God's glory. What should we say then? What about all this stuff, this, this new identity we have in Christ? Well, if sin abounded... If when sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Grace always gets bigger. What God did for us in Christ at Calvary is bigger than anything Adam could ever undo. Anything the devil could ever throw at us. Well, what should we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Should we now just live like there's no been nothing happened to us? What does he say? God forbid. I love that. That is what is called a dynamic equivalent. <laughs> Uh, in Bible translation. That's the Apostle Paul jumping up and down, screaming at the top of his lungs, pulling his hair out, saying, No! <laughs> Would you ever get that idea? How shall we that are dead to sin, we died with Jesus Christ to sin, how shall we over here live like we're still over there? You understand, folks, and I know what people say. They say, you preach grace to people, and you tell them that God will give them all this stuff as a free gift, and that they're complete in Christ, and they've been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, and God gave it to them free as a free gift, and gave it to them completely the moment they... You preach that to them, preacher, and they'll just go out and live in sin, live in the way they wanted to do. Let me tell you something. You don't have to preach grace to people from the live in sin. They're, going to live in, they're living in sin anyway. You don't, have, you don't have to have grace preached to you for you to live in the way you want to live. You're doing a right smart job of that before anybody ever thought about saving you. You know that? You know what the Bible says the strength of sin is? The law puts you on a performance system trying to do it on your own, focusing on your sin rather than focusing on what God gives you in His Son. If you understand what, what happened at Calvary, you'll understand that preaching what happened at Calvary doesn't set you free to, to live in sin. It sets you free from sin. You know what the Bible says? Jesus Christ, when He died at Calvary, He put away sin by the sacrifice of Himself. He just scratched it out. How? By the cross. So if you come to understand what really happened there, you'll never make that mistake of cheapening God's grace, you'll never make the mistake of mocking easy believism and all that. Let me tell you something. Believing better be easy if you're going to do it. You know that? I mean, believing is the only thing you can do that is easy because it's the only thing you can do without you doing anything is trusting what somebody else did. And what people do, they come along with their religious axe to grind and their religious cart to get before the horse and all that business. And some of them got good motivations and some of them don't. But they're all wrong. Because what grace is, is God's free gift to you. But when you get that gift, now you need to begin to open up the package. You know, if I gave you a gift, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If somebody came along on your birthday and gave you a gift, and you took it and you looked at the package and you said, that's beautiful, it's a beautiful bow, I love it, I appreciate it, and you took it and set it on the coffee table in your living room, and you never opened it. You know? You know what they'd think of you? They'd think you're a little touched in the head, I guess. They'd sure think you weren't very appreciative. Why did they give you the gift? So that you would admire the package and the wrapping and the bow. You know, you, know, you open a package and, you, and your wife's always saying, don't mess up the bow, so I'm not going to mess up the bow. No. I didn't give it to you for that. They gave it to you for you to tear the wrapping paper off, throw the bow on the floor, and open up the package and find out what's in it, and then use it. Well, that's where we are in Romans 6. Paul said, let's tear this thing open and let's go use it. Uh, the, the issue here is uh, getting into it, into what God's done for us in Christ, into the freedom that's ours in, in Him, into the identity and the standing and the position and the joy and the service that God's given us in Him and the empowerment that He's given us in Him and then putting that to work in our life, living consistently with who we are. 
And Romans chapter 6 has to do with living in the freedom that God has given us in His Son. Now you need to understand what that freedom is all about. So he says to you in verse 3, Know ye not? You see, the, the problem that, it, that the Romans were having, when someone throws this objection at you about, if you preach grace to people, you'll just, if you preach the gospel of grace to them and you tell them that it's all free through what Christ did and He did it all and it's only on the basis of what He did, you do that, well then what you're going to do is you're going to tell people to live in sin. When you hear people say that, it's because they're ignorant. They don't know some things about what God did do for them when, Christ, when, when they trusted Christ. That's why it says, verse 3, know ye not? I mean, wait a minute, don't you understand what God did? Don't you know that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death? Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of what? In newness of life. This is a basic fundamental fact of the Christian life. Don't you people know this basic simple fact that when you trusted Christ as your Savior, you were baptized into His death? You were baptized into Jesus Christ, and thus you were baptized into His death at Calvary. You were buried with Him by baptism into death, and you were raised with Him over here in His resurrection life to walk in newness of life. In other words, when Jesus Christ died, you died. When He was raised from the dead, you were raised. His death is yours. His life is yours. Don't you, did, didn't you get that? <laughs> well, where would you learn that? Well, you sure wouldn't learn it from religion, would you? You know, unfortunately, that basic fact of the Christian life is not often heard. How often do you hear about this? About the identification that God has given you in His Son's death and resurrection when you hear the sub subject of baptism talked about? Now you want to talk about religious TNT, dynamite, something that is an explosive subject, something that is controversial. Well, bring up the subject of baptism and see what happens. Most people, and you're pro you, you, see if that's not true of you. Most people when they hear the word baptize or baptism think of one thing. You know what it is? Water. <laughs> you read baptize and most people go, water, just just a knee-jerk reaction. And yet, this passage that we're reading here, to add water, into the, to make this baptism here water, is just to use religious tradition to cover over truth that you need to understand. There's a lot of different kind of baptisms in the Bible beside water baptism. You need to understand that. You can't just read that word and say, well, that's what it always is. For example, come back with me, if you will, to Luke chapter number 12. Get Luke chapter 12 in one hand, and uh, Matthew chapter 3 in one hand. Luke 12, Matthew chapter number 3, and then get 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. Now that's three passages. One hand get 1 Corinthians 10, one hand get Matthew 3, and then turn to Luke chapter number 12. Our Lord was baptized in water by John the Baptist, Matthew chapter 3. Then He was baptized with the Spirit by God the Father after His water baptism, Matthew chapter 3. So He had been baptized twice, once with water and once with the Holy Spirit. And yet in Luke chapter number 12, Verse number 50, the Lord Jesus Christ says, I have a baptism to be baptized with. And, and how am I straightened till it be accomplished? Now what's he talking about there? He says, I, I, he's already been baptized in water. He's already been baptized with the Holy Ghost. And yet he still has a, another baptism to be baptized with. Well, that other baptism isn't water baptism. 
and it's not the baptism of the Holy Ghost, then what is it? Well, it turns out in the passage to be a baptism with death at Calvary. A death baptism. You can be baptized with death, and it has nothing to do with water or the Holy Spirit. Matthew chapter 3, verse number 11. John, speaking to the nation Israel, he says, I indeed baptize you with water. There's one kind of baptism, under repentance. But he, he that cometh after me is mightier than I am, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. That's the second kind. And with fire. That's a third kind. What's that one? Well, the verse 12 says, Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he shall burn up fire, the chaff with unquenchable fire. There's a baptism of fire that's a baptism of judgment at the second coming of Christ. There's a baptism with the Holy Ghost that takes place on the day of Pentecost. And there's a baptism in water that John administered. There are three different kind of baptisms separated by time periods. Included in that is a baptism with death. Come with me to 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. Now here's a baptism that doesn't have anything. It's like, like the baptism with the Spirit and the baptism with death. has nothing to do with water at all. 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant, how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Now what's he talking about? He's talking about when God brought Israel out of Egypt, brought them up to the Red Sea, parted the Red Sea, and Israel goes across the Red Sea on dry ground and never got touched with any water. And the Shekinah glory cloud stood over them as they passed under it and went through the dry land and the dust of the Red Sea, across over to the other side. That Shekinah glory cloud stood there and held Pharaoh and the Egyptians off. They were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They never got wet. I mean, folks, it didn't like that stuff you see on the miracle shows on TV, you know, and all that, trying to explain it. God just stopped the water, put up the mountains of water on either side, and they walked through. God formed a miracle. And I expect if, if anybody got wet that day, if they had little boys and little girls, and like I've had little children in my family, you know, some little kid walked up there and looked at that wall of water and stuck his finger in it <laughs> to see if he couldn't catch a fish or something. And if he, one of them did that, that was the only way they got wet. But the baptism had nothing, they go, they go across, Exodus says, on dry ground. There's a dry baptism. Well, my friend, this baptism in Romans chapter 6 is a dry baptism. Just like the baptism with the Holy Ghost, just like the baptism of Christ with death, the one in Romans 6 is a dry baptism. It has absolutely nothing to do with water. You know, when the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 5, there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. You need to ask yourself, which baptism is that? Well, it's the same one here in Romans chapter 6. It's a baptism that the moment you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, God performs for you. 1 Corinthians chapter number 12 in one hand and Romans chapter 6. Now look at Romans chapter 6 very carefully. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death. Now you notice that. What were you baptized? The verse tells you what it is. The verse doesn't say as many of you as were baptized into water, have been buried with them in water. Now, now let's face it, folks, nobody buries people in water unless you're out to sea somewhere. You don't bury in water. That's not a medium uh, 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 in the Bible or anywhere else to bury people in. The verse doesn't say as many of you who were baptized into water it says, as many of you as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into His death. Now tell me something. Is that a physical baptism or a spiritual baptism? Well, have any of you physically been placed into Jesus Christ? Well, I know you know you haven't. Were you physically placed into His death? No. How were you placed there? 
spiritually. Spiritually. There's no way that you can read that verse and believe it's anything except spiritual. Because if that's physical, then, you, then water baptism is the thing that puts you into Jesus Christ. And you know that can't happen. You know that, in other words, baptism would be the thing by which you are regenerated. And you know that isn't true. Hold your hand here and come to 1 John chapter number 3. 1 John chapter number 3. If water baptism produces regeneration, in other words, water baptism is the way by which you are regenerated. Listen, then the thing that has to be regenerated would be the thing that's baptized. And tell me something. When you baptize somebody, what gets wet? You baptize them in water. What gets wet? Their flesh gets wet. Their body gets wet, doesn't it? Sure it does. Then their body's going to have to be the thing that's regenerated. But you've got a problem with that. 1 John chapter 3, verse number 9. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Well, tell me something. What part of you is born of God when you trust Christ as your Savior? Is it your old man? Well, whatever part of you that's born of God cannot commit sin. Now, I know what they say. They say, well, that means he can't go on continuously practicing it. But that's a stupid way to talk about life. I mean, let, let, let's don't be little, little Cub Scouts here now. Doesn't go on and commit, doesn't, doesn't continually practice it. How many times do you have to commit it to practice it? And, and which sin is it that you have to, I mean, are you talking about one sin you can't commit over and over? Or just, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. I mean, if you sin three times a day, is that practicing it? I mean, if you sin three times a day, folks, in, t in a year, you've got a thousand sins. That sounds like practicing it to me. You see, the part of you that's regenerated isn't your outward man. The part of you that's regenerated is your inner man. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. That's it. So the baptism in Romans, in, in, in Romans 6, it has nothing to do with water baptism. It has nothing to do with anything physical at all. If it did, it would mean that, that water baptism produced a physical regeneration. But rather, this is a baptism that puts you into Jesus Christ. Now, there isn't but one baptism in the Bible that's going to do that. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, look in your Bible at the passage, would you? You want to settle something for you? A lady told me just recently, she said, I was watching your TV broadcast and I got real mad at you. <laughs> she said, I just got fighting mad at what you were saying. And I went and got my husband and brought him and said, next week we're going we're gonna to watch that guy and I want you to see him. And they tuned in next week and they sat there and I was drawing some charts on the board and going through some verses and they said, boy, you know, that kind of explained this verse to me. Now, you know why they got some explanation? Just because they read the verses. And that's the key. So read this thing and let some light and understanding come on you. I don't have anything for you to join. I'm not trying to make any money off of you. I'm not trying to get anything from you. All I'm trying to do is make you understand something in God's Word that can be a blessing to you. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. For by one Spirit, listen, are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jew or Gentile, bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. Notice carefully. For by one Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, takes the believing sinner, by one spirit are we all, every believer has this happen to them, baptized into one body. Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. As many as of you has been baptized into Jesus Christ, have put on Christ. How do you get put in Him? By one spirit. Not by the preacher, not by a priest, not by a rite or a ceremony, but by God Himself taking you and placing you into Jesus Christ. Now, when you're taken by God and placed into Jesus Christ, what happens? Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death. Wherefore, we're buried by, with Him by baptism, not into water, but into death, into His death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we all should what? Walk in newness of life. We died with Him. We're resurrected with Him.
We died into sin, we live unto God. It all happens when God puts us into Christ. Because in Christ, everything that belongs to Him, His death, His resurrection, His session at the Father's right hand, His inheritance of all things belongs to me. Because I'm a part of Him, a part of His body, a part of who He is. That's why Paul says, now you are complete in Him. You see, in Christ, we have a complete standing. Now you're complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power. He says He's blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. When God puts you into Christ, He doesn't leave anything out. He puts you into His Son because there is where He has every good thing for you. How'd you get in Him? The moment you trusted Christ, God Himself put you into Christ. Now religion won't tell you about it. You don't feel it. You don't sense it. You don't know about it except through God's Word. And the whole basis of all that the Christian life is from that moment onward is based upon this wonderful truth and this wonderful fact of you being in Christ and you being made complete there. My friend, you don't need to ask God to come and work in your behalf and move in your behalf. You don't need to pray and seek and work to try to get God to work. God already has worked. He already has moved. He already is for you. What you need to do is find out in His Word what He's accomplished for you in His Son and then rest your faith and confidence in that and be filled, as Paul says, with joy and peace in believing what God in His Word says He has accomplished for you. That's what He means when He says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Tune in again next week. We'll study more about all this. Until then, earn out Thank you, Brother Jordan, for that message from the Word of God. Friends, we have a cassette tape that we'd like you to have to go along with today's study. The tape is entitled, Free at Last. It sure is free of charge. It's our way of saying thanks for listening. We'll be happy to see that you receive your free copy, along with a free subscription to our monthly Bible study, The Grace Journal, if you simply write us here at The Message of Grace. The address should be on your screen. That's The Message of Grace, Box 97, Bloomingdale, Illinois, 60108. If you prefer, you can also call us during regular business hours at area code 708-529-0520. Request tape offer number 249. That's tape offer number 249. The Message of Grace is a ministry of Grace School of the Bible, and we're glad you've been with us here today. If our study together has been a help to you, we would happily put you in touch with a Bible study in this area where the message of God's wonderful grace is proclaimed from His right divided word. And friend, if you are still not sure of salvation, that your sins are forgiven, and that you have eternal life as a present possession, let us know, and we'll be happy to send you some gospel literature that will show you the way. That address again is the message of grace, box 97, Bloomingdale, Illinois, 60108. Thanks for being with us today, and God's best until we next time for another message of grace.